Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, my name is Natalie Bauer, and I'm the DSpace program coordinator. And we are here today for a question and answer session on the 7.6 release. Um, just a housekeeping item, we do have <clears throat> simultaneous interpretation available today. So just go to the interpretation button and select Spanish if you would like to listen in Spanish. Um, okay, without any further ado, we'll begin. Tim, can you do the next slide? So just a quick announcement that these releases and uh, functionality improvements are made possible through contributions from the community, especially to the DSpace Development Fund. This allows us to have more predictable releases greater and greater community oversight of development outcomes. DSpace is for and by the community. You can also contribute to the DSpace Development Fund by becoming an institutional member of DSpace, increasing your membership level one time or recurring, and making a one-time con contribution, institutional or individual, to the development fund. And you can contact us at the email address listed below or check out our wiki for more information. And now I'm going to hand things over to Tim Donahue, our lead, tech lead for DSpace, who's going to guide us through this question and answer session and also give us some quick updates on DSpace 7.6 release. Thanks, Natalie. Let me get my slides going again here. Okay. Um, so before I go into some of the updates for uh, 7.6, I did want to remind everybody that we do have a Q&A document uh, that is at the URL at the bottom there. And Natalie, if you could copy that into the chat um, if folks need to, to grab it. Um, there are already some questions in that document. I'll make sure that the questions that are asked in that document either are answered today or will be answered after this session if they're a little bit more detailed or I have to dig into finding the answer myself. Um, but the questions in there will get answered so you can keep that as a link that you can refer back to uh, for any of the questions um, that are already there or you can continue to add them throughout this session here. Um, you're also welcome to ask questions in the chat. Uh, you won't be able to unmute, but you can put a question in the chat if things come up. Um, and Natalie will help me kind of comb through those as we go um, uh, through this session. And there'll be a lot of time for questions at the end. Uh, but before we get into those questions, um, I do want to go through a quick overview of what we've done recently with 7.6. And I also want to answer a couple of the frequently asked questions that we see very often on the mailing lists, on Slack, um, any of those other places that we use for support. Um, so we'll go through some of those right now with you all. Um, but first, I did want to note that we've had seven releases in two years. Um, so if you've been keeping track of all of these releases that have been coming out, there's a lot of new features that have come across everything. Um, uh, that have come across in DSpace 7. So lots of new features layered into every single release. If you're already on one of these releases, um, you may want to upgrade to the latest because there are even more new features that have come out within 7.6. Um, and I also wanted to quickly highlight um, some of the reasons why we highly recommend you upgrading to DSpace 7 as soon as possible if you haven't already. Um, or to DSpace 7.6. These are things that I've gone through in past Q&A sessions, but it's good to kind of revisit them. Uh, first, just noting, you know, we have the single user interface that is built with um, web uh, best practices uh, in terms of accessibility, in terms of search engine optimization and everything like that. We have an integration ready REST API. We have the new configurable entities features, which I'll talk about a little bit here um, today. Uh, you can upgrade from any past release. Uh, your data will move over in a more automatic fashion from the database, and it's also backwards compatible with your old integrations. Um, and we do our best to align with repository best practices. So things like OpenAir, 
um, signposting, which is a, one of the core next generation repositories recommendations, GDPR alignment. Um, and new in DSpace 7 is that um, every single code change now has automated tests and is automatically scanned for any sort of security vulnerabilities. So we're trying to make it as secure and stable as possible out of the box. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little bit of a frog in my throat. Um, let's see, uh, but 10 features also that are not available in DSpace 6 or below to be aware of are these 10 right here. This is just, there's many more that are that are not listed here. These are the top 10 that I could think of. I mentioned the REST API, the configurable entities. We also have ORCID authentication and synchronization with your ORCID profile. There's now IIIF support, or you can use, use a basic image video um, audio viewer. Either one of those or both of those are possible to enable. You can run many of the command line scripts now from a new processes menu. Uh, we have the ability to pre-register handles and DOIs. Uh, I mentioned open air. Uh, Researcher profiles is now a thing in DSpace 7 where you can have your own profile in DSpace that can sync up optionally with ORCID, with your ORCID profile. Uh, we have new forms of authentication, not just ORCID, but also OpenID Connect. And we have a lot of great uh, ways to import metadata from external services, some of which are mentioned here. This allows you to get a submission started very rapidly because you don't have to do as much manual entry um, of the metadata. So these are kind of 10 more reasons to go to get up to DSpace 7 as soon as you can. Uh, so what's new in 7.6 that just came out um, a little less than a month ago uh, back in June? These are the four um, biggest features that you'll see in 7.6. Uh, the batch or policy management tool allows you to manage privileges across many different community collections or items at once so that you can quickly and easily embargo many items at once or embargo many bit streams or files at once. You can also remove embargoes or access restrict everything at once or remove access restrictions. It allows you a lot of those um, management of permissions in a much easier fashion. And this tool has been completely rebuilt and redesigned um, in DSpace 7. And there was an old version of this in DSpace 6 that was a little clunky and it could be a little bit complex to, to work with, uh, but we've had a complete redesign in DSpace 7 and we hope you'll find it a lot easier to work with. And I'm gonna show a little demo of that shortly, uh, just to give you a sense of what's there. Uh, we also newly added signposting, um, the scholarly web, which is a best practice from core um, to allow DSpace to um, represent what objects are included um, or how to, how, to, how to get information about objects, metadata about various objects and links to their files via these signposting links and headers. There's much more information on the links that are in this slide, um, but we support the FAIR signposting level, um, signposting profile uh, level two. I um, mean, I should mention, I'm gonna pause here for a moment to mention these slides will be available after this session. Um, so there are a lot of links um, in, within the slides. You'll have this all available to you afterwards. You don't need to copy anything down. Um, you'll have this available um, immediately after the session. Uh, we also have primary bitstream support. So by default in DSpace 7, the very first bitstream or very first file in your list is the one that is used for things like thumb, thumbnails or full text searching. Um, if for some reason you don't want that first bitstream to be that, that one, the primary one, you can now flag a different one as the primary and that will be the one that is used for thumbnail display and full text indexing and all that. And finally, there's browse by hierarchical controlled vocabularies, which allows you to uh, quickly find things that use a hierarchical controlled vocabulary within DSpace. This is an optional feature um, in terms of uh, the submission uh, forms, but when it's enabled within the submission forms, you now have a browse by option uh, within the browse by tools. There's a many, many, many more improvements and bug fixes that are not listed here. Um, the release notes are at the bottom um, of this slide and you can easily find them out on the web as well. Um, so I'd recommend taking a look there, but these are the top four features that are out of that new release. Um, and this gives you a little demo of that bulk access control management feature from the admin menu. Um, and it's gonna show us uh, searching across uh, collections and communities and items. You can select multiple here. So we can select a couple collections we wanna manage permissions within. Uh, 
And then at the bottom, you can decide whether you want to change item uh, object metadata um, permissions or bitstream permissions. In this case, we're changing both to be admin only. And when we execute that, that runs a script behind the scenes that will automatically update all of the items and bit streams within those selected collections to have the permissions you selected. Uh, you can also use that same tool, as I mentioned, to remove uh, permissions, but you get a nice little report out here of what permissions were updated uh, for which items. And this is just the, the video starting over again and showing it from the admin menu. Um, and also, it's not only available from the admin menu, but I have a second one here that shows that you can do these same permissions man management from the item um, access control tab, or even the community and collection. When you're editing a community and collection or an item, you can manage individual file permissions or um, all of the items or all of the files within a collection or community. In this case, I'm showing just embargoing a single bitstream within an item. Um, so I selected the bitstream and set an embargo date. And so the same tool can be used to just embargo a single file much more easily than managing it um, sort of in a manual fashion via the policy uh, editor. Um, so this is it again, just showing from the edit item screen, there's this new access control tab. That same tab is on this, the collection and the community screens. It allows you the same sort of capabilities. So this is one of the features we're most excited about within the 7.6 release. Uh, it took a lot of effort. And like I mentioned, it was a complete redesign from what was in DSpace 6. Um, so we hope that it's a lot easier to use now uh, within DSpace 7. Uh, with the 7.6 release, I also want to um, highlight and mention again that DSpace 7 is now considered feature complete. Um, so all of the old DSpace 6 features that we've been porting little by little into the DSpace 7 release, all those top three tiers, which are the uh, highest priority, uh, medium high, and medium priority, all of those have been more, uh, ported over to DSpace 7. And the medium low, almost everything except for maybe one has been ported over, and there are some low priority things that have not been ported. So there's only a couple features that existed within DSpace 6 that are not in DSpace 7. Most of those are quite low priority and we don't anticipate them impacting many users. Um, it is still possible for those to get into DSpace 8, which I'll talk more about later on, uh, but we're waiting on volunteers for those very low priority features just simply because we're not really sure who's even using them anymore, um, which is why they're such low priority. Um, but, uh, but if you are using them or find um, you need those features, uh, there are opportunities to uh, contribute that back either by adding the code yourself or hiring a service provider or talking a little bit with the steering committee and we can look at how we could potentially prioritize things for the future. Um, with all this said, this means that DSpace 7 has entered maintenance mode. So we will not have any new features added to DSpace 7 after that 7.6 release. This will make the upgrades within DSpace 7 a lot easier. It'll just be simple bug fixes. Um, all the new features now will be moving towards the 8 release, which I'll talk about um, later on here in this little intro. And so I did want to quickly, before we get to opening up to, to the questions and looking at the Q&A document, I wanted to quickly go through um, some of the tips that we've come across in terms of upgrading. Uh, since I know a lot of people are still in the process of doing this upgrade or have started it um, and may not have finished it yet. These tips are all based on the DSpace 7 upgrade webinar that we had last year in November. Um, so I'd still recommend going back and looking at that webinar if you need additional help or want a little bit more um, tips or hints during your upgrade process. There's a lot of <clears throat> a lot of good information back in that webinar, <clears throat> but the tips that I have here provide some of the summary information of what came out of that, as well as recently asked questions on on lists around <clears throat> excuse me around some of those tips. Let me get a quick drink of water here. Okay, so let's go through a couple of these tips here. Um, the first thing I mentioned this already, but it does come up, is whether or not you can upgrade from any old release. As I mentioned, your backend data will automatically upgrade via our database migration scripts. 
if you are upgrading from a version that's older than DSpace 6, you might want to consider starting with fresh configuration because there's a new local CFG file that was added in DSpace 6 that makes configs a lot easier to manage. So you might want to, uh, during the upgrade, start fresh with a brand new local CFG and copy your old configs over into that. Um, I would also recommend reviewing the release notes for each of the versions you're jumping over. Like if you're going from four all the way to seven, you might want to be aware of what got added in five as well as in six um, before you do that full migration. But again, that is possible. You can jump over old releases. Uh, you just want to kind of review what was there and those old releases. Uh, there are two upgrade options available. So you can upgrade in place. We have our upgrade guide um, in the documentation that walks you through upgrading all the prerequisites, doing an upgrade to the back end, and then installing the front end. Um, so that's option one. The second option is to actually start fresh, where you can install DSpace 7 fresh with no data within it, install just the front end and the back end. Um, and then once you're comfortable with that front end back end, once you're sure it's running, it looks good, you can migrate your existing data over into it. Either option is possible and people choose either uh, different options for different reasons. It really is a matter of kind of looking at both options and deciding which one you think would work best for your institution. And we do have a migration guide there, that last link, the migrate existing data link, um, links you over to the migration guide, which walks you through how to migrate your data over. Um, and there's been many, many institutions who have done that successfully and found that an easier way in some ways uh, than doing the step-by-step -step upgrade. But your mileage may vary and it's up to you which approach you'd like to take. <clears throat> in terms of our recommended approach, I did wanna note that we do have Excuse me here. I've got a cat that's jumping on my my table here. Uh, quick cat introduction. You can't see her because of my, there we go. Because <laughs> of my background video, um, I got to get her off the table here. Uh, but um, uh, in terms of starting fresh versus upgrading in place, we do recommend that from the scale of this upgrade, you really should consider whether starting fresh would be easier for you. Uh, because in some ways, it can be an easier way to get familiar with DSpace 7 and understand the setup. So you can get more comfortable with the installation, the setup, and the configuration before you go live. Um, so this is something I would recommend for folks who are feeling uncomfortable about the upgrade process or just feel that DSpace 7 has too many new things and you want to get more comfortable with it. It is completely reasonable to go with this approach. So I would recommend um, really considering this if that's where your institution sits. This has come up several times as well uh, as to whether you need to run the front end and back end on different servers or the same server. Either approach works. So you do not need to have them on different servers. You can choose which approach works best for you. They could be on the same server if you wish. They can be on different servers. The main thing to note, though, is that they do both need to be publicly available. So you cannot have the back end be locked down behind a firewall unless the front end is also locked behind that firewall, because the front end needs to be able to communicate via the back to the back end um, at the same sort of level that the front end is accessible at. Uh, this comes up frequently as well. Um, in fact, I think I saw a question on this in the Q&A document as to whether you can run DSpace 7 via Docker. You can, and there are institutions that are already doing that. Uh, we do have uh, Docker scripts that are available in our front end and back end code base. Right now, those are really development oriented. Um, so you're welcome to repurpose them and reuse them. A lot of the concepts you'd need to run DSpace 7 and Docker are already in those scripts. Uh, we are also actually working on getting our demo site deployed via these same scripts. So we're currently working on updating those Docker scripts for a demo site deployment. Um, that will require some small changes to the scripts and some of those changes have already been made, um, but that will that should give you a little bit more comfortability with the fact that these scripts can run a production level environment. But again, I would highly recommend you uh, take a close look at what's in the scripts. There are probably going to be updates that will be required to allow you to run it in production. We do not have an out of the box installation or upgrade process via Docker, but you can very easily run DSpace 7 via Docker. Uh, so if your team is very comfortable with Docker, please take a look at our scripts. 
feel free to use reuse as much as you want um, and, and go with the deployment in that approach because it is a, a nice way to set up DSpace 7. <clears throat> Um, this is a new tool. PM2 is a brand new tool within the DSpace 7 user interface. So we have had institu institutions ask, do I need this process manager to run the user interface? Um, it's a process manager tool that runs any Node.js app, um, and the front end is a Node.js application. Uh, we do recommend installing it with PM2. In fact, this is part of the installation instructions that we have. It's not a required tool. You could use other tools. But the thing that we like most about PM2 is the cluster mode, which allows you to scale the user interface and get much better performance out of it than many of the other Node.js uh, process manager tools. So we would highly recommend you use this tool and get comfortable with it and look at the cluster mode as well. Uh, because that does help scale and, and performance wise. Um, but you can use other tools. You just may want to make sure that they have similar functionality uh, to be able to deploy that front end. And there's much more information on PM2 and the installation instructions, including links over to it and all of that. Um, and in fact, I want to bring this up because this has come up recently on mailing lists. Um, there's been some sites that have, once they've scaled things up and they've got, they're gone to production, they have lots of content coming in, uh, they have lots of users hitting the site. They've noticed that the homepage starts loading a little bit slowly. And usually that is one of these first two things um, in terms of um, something that you may have skipped over or overlooked, or you may want to try to help scale even better. Usually it's either that you're not running PM2 in that cluster mode, which provides much better performance, or um, as of 7.5, there's a caching option that we have in the user interface that allows you to cache the uh, pages for anonymous users only. So when anonymous users or even when bots come to your site, they get a slightly cached version of your site. It's only a couple seconds old, um, and you can actually configure how old you want that cached version to be. But that provides a lot better performance, especially on the home page or any page that has a lot of content on it. Um, so you might want to consider looking at that caching option and also that cluster mode, because those two together usually solve um, the, the majority of those problems that we've seen so far. Um, another option here is to look at how much memory you've given to Node.js. Um, if, if none of this works, and I've not heard of that scenario yet, but if none of that works, you also could limit how many recent submissions you're showing on the home page. Um, and there's a link to how to do that there. But we do have a performance tuning guide in, a, in the documentation that's linked at the bottom. Um, that is a great guide and it's constantly kept up to date with uh, tips we've learned or uh, as people are installing stuff, if they run into a new problem we haven't seen before and we figure out a way around it, we update it in the performance tuning documentation. But you may want to keep an eye on that page because there's lots of tips for how to make uh, DSpace perform better both from the front end and from the back end um, and how to kind of tune things for your needs. And if you learn any tips yourself, I should mention as well, please either send them my way or post them on, on our mailing list and we'll make sure they get back into this documentation because the documentation really is a collaborative effort. And as we learn new things that we can do to improve performance even better for certain types of scenarios, it's great for us to document those for others who hit that same problem along the way. Uh, and this is something I'm going to sit with here for a couple minutes and go through a couple slides here in terms of uh, needing configurable entities. I mentioned this in past um, webinars as well, but it comes up a lot. A lot of people looking at the upgrade for DSpace 7, uh, look at the new configurable entities feature and wonder whether or not they need to do every, a migration over to everything to entities or what they should be doing with all their old DSpace 6 content as they update uh, to DSpace 7. So I do want to uh, talk about this and revisit this again uh, just with you all here. Um, first off, it is worth noting that entities are still an advanced feature. Um, they are a very useful feature. And if you need this feature, um, I'd highly recommend um, updating uh, as, uh, to DSpace 7 and using entities. However, they're an advanced feature because they're, they're new and they're not built into every single aspect of DSpace 7 yet. 
Um, that's stuff we're working on. Uh, so for example, the archival information packages, AIPs, don't yet support um, entities fully. Uh, they support some of the basic uh, metadata capturing of, 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 of the item level metadata, but they don't support uh, representing all the relationships between entities. Um, so if you're very dependent on AIPs, um, that's a limitation to be aware of. We don't have any sort of bulk migration at this point in time. You can migrate individual items uh, one by one. Uh, and there's some tips about that in the configurable entities docs, but um, essentially it's just a single metadata field you can change in the item to transform it into an entity, but there's not a bulk migration um, script at this point in time. And you also need to set up your collections in order to use entities properly. So for every entity type you want to use, you need to have at least one collection that can accept that type of entity from a submission or deposit standpoint. Um, so those are just some limitations to be aware of. And because of those limitations, um, it's worth uh, going through when you might want to enable entities versus disable them. So if you are really dependent or really excited about uh, using the researcher profiles or the syncing your local profile with an ORCID profile, then you definitely need entities because those both require entities. Uh, we cannot do that sync with ORCID without entities and researcher profiles are basically a person entity page that is associated with your, your login account. So you would need entities in that scenario. Um, or if you find that the default entities that are set up within DSpace that are provided there align well with the sort of content you're putting in, you might want to consider migrating over to entities sooner rather than later. But it is worth noting that you do not need to migrate all your content to entities at once. You're allowed to have items and entities living together. So when you do the upgrade process from DSpace 6 to DSpace 7, you can keep all of your old DSpace 6 items as just basic items if you want to and start to add brand new entities and you can slowly move items over to entities if you feel like it uh, or when you feel like it. You don't need to do this all at once. It is not a required feature. Um, you can um, use both together at the same point in time as well. So that's uh, worth being well aware of. Even if you enable entities, you don't have to migrate everything into it. Um, and you might want to keep entities disabled, which is the default, I should note, if you depend heavily, like I mentioned, on the AIP backup and restore functionality. If you really just aren't interested in being an early adopter, you don't need that advanced feature for any particular reason. Or if this upgrade already looks very complex to your institution, you can upgrade to entities at any point in time. It's very easy to turn them on and enable them um, even after you've upgraded to DSpace 7. So if, if this looks daunting to you, then I'd recommend upgrading to DSpace 7 with entities turned off initially. And then you can later on, whether it's six months or a year later, you can say, okay, let's try out entities now. And you can enable them at that point in time and begin to create some entities. You don't need to do it all at once. Um, and again, as I said, um, even once you've enabled entities, you can keep all your old items as is. You don't need to migrate them to entities unless you want to. So there's a lot of options available, but I'm just trying to alleviate any concerns there that entities are not required in any way. Um, and it's totally up to you what approach works best for you. And even once they're enabled, you don't have to use them for everything. <clears throat> and one other question, just to be aware of, I don't know that there are many other people still using Oracle anymore, but Oracle support was removed in 7.6. That was a change um, to that latest release as well. So we do require now that you run on Postgres. Uh, there are some tips there for how you can migrate to Postgres if you are still on Oracle. Um, uh, and I know that there was at least one institution that used that Aura 2PG tool to do a migration. There's been others who've used just the AIP backup and restore that works as well, except for those in progress submissions. Um, but if you need any help with that, you're welcome to ask on lists. Uh, there are people who've done this before and you're also welcome to, to contact some of our service providers who might be able to help you through this migration if this impacts you. Um, and that said, um, if you run into issues along the way with DSpace 7, uh, there are lots of places to get help here. Uh, these are some of the common questions that come on the list all the time. So the UI is not loading or it's just spinning or I get a 500 error, what does that mean? Or I can't log in or I'm getting 400, 403 forbidden. 
Um, these sort of things come up a lot. Uh, and we have guides for walking through these problems. So there's a common installation issues link at the bottom. This is at the very bottom, the install process, which lists all of these errors and how to fix them or different options to look at with fixing them. So that's the first place to look. If you're hitting a weird behavior and you're not sure what's going on, uh, go to that common installation issue, see if it's already got a solution there. If you can't even figure out what the issue is or why the UI isn't working right, if something weird is happening in the user interface, that troubleshoot an error page is a great place to go. It walks you through how to find the underlying error that's going on. If the UI is not loading properly, chances are there's an error happening either in the user interface level or on the back end. And that troubleshoot an error page walks you through how to find those errors. Um, and once you find the error, it might be one of the ones listed in that common installation issues page. So it's worth noting that these resources are there to allow you to try and help yourself um, as much as possible. And we keep them updated based on things that we see that have come up frequently. Um, as always, there's also uh, support options. The last link there goes to our list of support options, which includes uh, the mailing list, Slack, um, even these sort of webinars um, and other documentation, um, as well as the service providers, as I mentioned. There are also options for support. If you want to pay somebody for training or support, um, they're there uh, to provide, provide that to the community at large. Um, so you're not alone ask for help on any of those channels and take a look at what we've documented already because a lot of the problems that people have hit into are common problems. And it's ch chances are the problem you're hitting has probably been encountered by someone else as well and hopefully solved along the way. Um, so I do wanna go through a couple things about building and maintenance and then we're gonna open this up to questions here. Um, DSpace is now uh, moved over to being maintained by the DSpace developers team again. We used to have a DSpace 7 working group, um, and that working group uh, was essentially a rename of the developers team. But now that DSpace 7 has moved into maintenance mode and we're looking towards DSpace 8, which, I'm, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, we've just renamed our team. We're now a DSpace developers team. We're doing both maintenance of DSpace 7, uh, doing bug fixes there, as well as starting to look at new features for DSpace 8. If you're interested in any of what's going on with development activities, those meetings are completely open to anybody to attend. The agendas are always open on the wiki as well. We meet every Thursday. You're welcome to just jump into a meeting and, and listen in if you want. Um, you're also welcome to uh, join us on Slack. There's a dev channel there. If you have development questions, you can ask them there uh, and we'll get somebody, get an answer to you there. Um, and it's worth noting, though, that uh, the members in those in the, both the channel and on, in the meetings are volunteering their time to, to build and improve DSpace. So it's really a collaborative effort. Uh, we do have that DSpace development fund that Natalie mentioned earlier, where we're able to fund a portion of development work from some trusted service providers at times. But those are usually feature-specific uh, development. And the majority of the work here coming from service providers as well as community members is volunteer-oriented. So we'd really welcome other volunteers to get involved because the more of us that get involved, uh, the better DSpace gets and the more quickly it gets better, all of that. Um, and that to that point, if you have a feature you need to get built into DSpace or it's a feature that's listed out there and a ticket, but it doesn't seem to be moving along and you really need it now, um, the options there are really to donate the feature yourself or look at that DSpace development fund. Um, so we do take volunteer work from anyone. Um, we just recommend you create a ticket and let us know that you're working on this feature so that we don't have somebody else do the same work. Uh, we don't want two people building the same thing. Uh, we'd like to avoid that if at all possible. Uh, service providers also can be hired to build things on behalf of institutions that do not have developers um, available. Uh, so they do that quite frequently. M many of the larger service providers that we work with um, all the time uh, will build a feature and they'll donate it back to DSpace and it'll come out in the next release. So you can talk to them about what features you need built um, and, and sign a contract with them to make that happen if that's of interest to you. And then there's the development fund, as I mentioned, which can go towards funding new features based on the priorities of the steering group uh, for the next release. 
And this gives you just a sense of how many code contributors we have um, in the DSpace 7 code base. Uh, 7.0 had the most code, unique control, code contributors by far because it was uh, a massive amount of work through several betas uh, to get it out the door. Um, and then we've slowly been ramping back up to about the 50s in terms of each release has about 50 people uh, contributing code. And there's other contributors that come in along the way as well, contributing documentation, translations. This is just the folks that are doing code for us right now. Um, and I do anticipate this, this will keep ramping upwards little by little as more and more get comfortable with DSpace 7. Um, but you're definitely not alone if you wanna try and jump into DSpace 7 and, and help us out. We'd love any volunteers that are interested in doing that. And there's lots of other people to learn from here along the way um, as you get your feet wet with uh, DSpace development. So briefly now, um, I mentioned uh, DSpace 7 has entered maintenance mode. Uh, the next release is going to be a 7.6.1 release. So everything's going to be numbered in that fashion uh, based on 7.6, because 7.6 was the last one with new features. So we are only providing fixes now, uh, whether those are bug fixes, usability, security fixes, uh, things of that nature uh, can go into seven still, uh, but no new features along the way. Uh, we do not have a release date yet for that 7.6.1 release. We're already fixing some small bugs that have been found, uh, but that release date will be announced as soon as we feel like we've we've got a decent group of bugs fixed up that we can release out to get folks um, uh, up to date on the latest uh, bug fixes. And to that point, if you find any issues along the way, we always recommend reporting issues you found so we can find somebody to help us out in fixing them uh, and get that into the next bug fix release. And with 8.0, as I alluded to, we we're already starting to discuss um, 8.0. The planning though has just begun. We just got 7.6 out the door. We've been restructuring uh, the development team a little bit in terms of trying to get ourselves aligned towards both maintaining DSpace 7 as well as new development for DSpace 8. So we're having some discussions in those development team meetings about some ideas that we have that could come into DSpace 8 or even DSpace 9. Um, so a lot of this is really in the early stages, uh, but 8 right now is likely to include new features that missed that 7.6 release. There were some brand new to DSpace features that did not get into 7.6. They had never existed in DSpace before, uh, and we're looking at bringing those to DSpace 8. Um, that exact list is still under discussion within steering, um, and developers are also talking little by little about some of the features on there as well. Um, it is worth noting that with DSpace 8, we're transitioning back to our release numbering scheme that we had before DSpace 7. This means that new features will only be in that 8.0 release. After 8.0 goes out, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, those will be bug fixes only. And that's the process we'll go through for 8, for 9, for 10 as we go along. And we're also going to have one major release a year. So 8.0 will come out in 2024, 9.0 will come out in 2025, 10.0 in 2026. So we're trying to get back to our regular scheduled, predictable release schedule and also make the upgrades between um, uh, those minor versions a lot easier. So going from 8.0 to 8.1 should be a, a lot easier of an upgrade. It'll just be bug fixes um, as you go along there. Um, so that's a little bit of a change back to how we used to do things for DSpace 5 and DSpace 6, um, and just want to make, make it clear that that's the process we're moving back to. A lot of these dates, as you can see, are really to be announced or to be determined. They're under discussion and in, in steering. Um, and as soon as we have something to announce in terms of the 8.0 schedule, uh, that'll go out to the list um, around uh, when that release will be planned to come out and what features we think is are going to be in that release. But that's all happening right now. Uh, and finally, um, the last slide um, is really how you can help. I've mentioned a lot of these things already. We've got becoming a member or, or funding the DSpace Development Fund, which we mentioned already, um, contributing code in that developer team. Uh, we have a new learning DSpace documentation section, which the DCAT team has been working on. Um, if you're interested in documenting DSpace from a user perspective, there's opportunities there to, cont to contribute documentation there and enhance what's been started there. 
Um, the DSpace Community Advisory Team, or DCAT, has monthly meetings. You're welcome to join them. That is a repository manager interest group. So they discuss um, how how institutions use DSpace, what they're using things for. Uh, they work on that learning DSpace documentation. Um, sometimes they're discussing the upgrade processes or things they've hit. There's different topics each month, and I'd recommend going to their uh, wiki page if you're interested in joining any of their discussions. We also have a large number of DSpace user groups that have popped up around the world. Um, so you may want to look at our user group page to see if there's one nearby you um, that you could join or get involved with. Um, as always, report any issues you find, try things out, um, and we really do appreciate supporting others. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the work in DSpace is volunteer-based, so when you see questions on mailing lists or Slack that you know the answer to or you've run into and figured out, um, if you can answer those for us, that really helps things out a lot and helps um, build a, a stronger knit community and helps everybody uh, make DSpace better and learn DSpace together. Um, so please do ask questions there, but also help others out um, if you happen to know the answer to something that gets asked there. And with that, we're going to jump over to the, um, the Q&A document and we're going to open things up uh, for live questions here in the chat, as well as the Q&A document itself that have been asked um, beforehand. So let me see. Um, there's a couple of chat questions already that I'll jump to first. And Natalie, I'm, I'm going to ask you to help me out. I'll also jump over to the the um, yeah. There's no there's no questions in the the chat chat. There are a couple in the Q and A, and then I also put some in the the document. So I would say we could start with those two that are open in the Q and A. Sure. Um, so in the Q&A, the first question here is, how long do you support DSpace 7.6.x? Is 7.6 an LTS release? Uh, yes, uh, it is an LTS release in that um, uh, it will be supported for at least, or for three years, essentially. Um, so DSpace 7 is under support until DSpace let's see, eight, nine, until DSpace 10 comes out. Um, so every release of DSpace, um, by default is supported for at least three years or three releases. So DSpace 7 is supported while DSpace 8 is out, while DSpace 9 is out. And then as soon as 10 is released, uh, three years after the fact, that's when 7 would go out of support. And same with 8. 8 would be under support until DSpace 11 comes out. Um, so that's our general support policy. Um, that did change a little bit with 5 and 6 recently, where we had to um, announce that they were they had to go end of life earlier than anticipated. Um, but that was a very special scenario where those releases were so very old that it was becoming incredibly complex to support them. But our policy has been um, a three-year release or three-year support policy, um, and that's documented under that um, under our our, um, our release policy and that release numbering scheme as well. Uh, let's see. Another question, did I hear correctly that there is not currently a way to bulk transform anything into a configurable entity? Does that include a point of migration from seven to six? There's not a way to change authors to configured persons. Um, that is correct. There is not currently a way to bulk transform anything into a configurable entity. Um, the only way that you can do a transformation right now from something from DSpace 6 into an entity is if it is already an item in DSpace 6, you could change uh, the DSpace entity type metadata field to represent an entity type, which transforms that item into an entity. Um, but because all entities are items, this is documented in the uh, configurable entities docs. Um, that metadata field you need to add. Uh, but you cannot transform things like if you had. Um, uh, an old journal hierarchy represented in communities and collections in DSpace 6. We don't have a way to migrate those communities and collections hierarchy into the new journal entities. We also don't have a way to migrate an author metadata field from DSpace 6 into a new person entity. Those don't exist right now, and that's why I mentioned it's an advanced feature. Um, so there's there's stuff you would have to do yourself to, to do that migration if you want to migrate things forward. Um, but uh, but 
at a very basic level, you can migrate those items, individual items from DSpace 6 into entity types of publication, for example. Um, that's the, the most basic migration you have. we have. Um, so that is not part of the upgrade process right now. And that's why entities are turned off by default is because they're an advanced feature. And that's also why um, you can have entities and items side by side, because we anticipate even if you want to turn on entities, you're probably going to have a lot of old content that has not been migrated over to entities, and you can run them both side by side at the same time. Okay, and that's all the ones in the Q&A area that I see. Hey, Tim. Let's, yes. Um, I think it might be a good idea to share the question and answer document on your screen, and I put the link in there we the go. chat in case people want to add to it. Ah, yeah, there's a lot of people in there right now. Okay. So, and I'm going to admit a lot of these are brand new. So I'm looking at these for the first time. <laughs> I'm going to see which ones I think um, uh, I can answer quickly here. And uh, if you add questions, please add them to the end of the document. Yes, Not please do. Kidding. Thank you. This first question, I, I remember this being on mailing lists. Um, and I believe um, there was some answers provided there. It looks like Keith Gilbertson, thanks Keith, also noted that um, it fix, fixed for him when he just logged out and logged back in. Um, I think there might be a caching issue there um, when you first update uh, to DSpace 7.5 or 7.6, but um, but I, I have not seen that behavior um, long-term. So I would look at the troubleshooting guide uh, to look for underlying errors. If you're having weird behavior in the user interface, Always take a look at that troubleshooting guide that was on the, the slides that I had um, today, and I'll share those slides after the fact, because there's po it's possible there's an error underneath that is causing that weird behavior. But that's not one I can answer here quickly. Uh, DOI registration, so the DOI is in one metadata field versus the other. I believe DOI registration in DSpace 7 works pretty much the same as in DSpace 6. So I think it would work the same way as in DSpace 6, um, if because because you say it's it was possible in older versions. I think it's pretty much the same. I may have to go back and look at the docs for that myself to see if something has changed there. Uh, but I believe it's the same um, in DSpace 7 as DSpace 6. If there's any other developers in here that know the answer to that, um, please feel free to add it into this document here. Um, let's see, new version has a lot of changes. Is it possible to easily export a list of documents by author from a current community? Um, the first one in terms of exporting documents, uh, the best way to do that in DSpace 7 is probably to do a search on DSpace 7 to find the things you want to export, and then you can export them to CSV from the search results. Um, so that would be the best option for DSpace 7. Exporting downloads and consults. I'm not sure I understand what consults are. This sounds like it's statistics right now, and there's not really great exporting statistics options at this point in time, but I can uh, revisit this after the, the, the chat here today uh, and see if there's anything else I can find on that one. Uh, for... Um, it's possible there's a bug there. It looks like you're hitting translation issues on particular fields. I don't know off the top of my head um, whether those fields are hard coded. It's possible they are. We have run into this in the past where accidentally some text in the user interface is hard coded to English. Um, that is always an accident. <laughs> we never want it to be hard coded to English. Um, so if that's the case, that would be considered a bug, and um, I'd recommend creating a ticket so we can get that fixed uh, in DSpace 7.6.x. Um, so that would probably be a bug if that's what you're seeing. But I'll take a look at that afterwards as well. Uh, I want to know if we can work in production with containers. So this sounds like it's related to Dockers or Docker containers. Um, I answered that a little bit today. You can work with Docker containers. We have scripts you can base your uh, work on. 
uh, but we do not have any out of the box scripts that you can just spin up yourself uh, in production. You'd want to take a look at our scripts and update them based on your production scenarios. But you are more than welcome to use Docker in production. And I do know that several service providers use Docker in production and some institutions as well. So it's it's a common setup or relatively common. Uh, six, how do you create author links on item pages with authority records turned on? I think author links author links happen on the item pages automatically, but I don't know if they, uh, in terms of linking you back to the the um, the list of author or the list of other items from that author. I think they happen automatically as of seven point five, maybe. I'll have to go back and look. I don't know that authority records impact that, but I might be misunderstanding that question, so I may have to revisit that as well. Um, but I believe they happen pretty much automatically on our demo site. You could look at demo7.dspace.org and see if they're already appearing there. And if so, that's a feature that is in the later uh, DSpace 7 releases. Um, is it possible to perform a massive relation of entities by using the API? Yes, it would be possible. So the REST API, it's worth noting, is has every single feature in DSpace. Since the user interface is a JavaScript-based interface, every feature it uses is in the REST API. So, um, And that also means you could build scripts against the REST API to do things in bulk. So if you can do it once, you could build a loop over something. Uh, it would require your own coding, but you can code it in whatever language you want. You could build a loop, looping code that would actually do that same thing over and over again. Um, I don't know how easy it will be because it may depend on your setup, but the REST API has every feature and you can definitely code it to do anything you want it to do. Um, let's see, what's the best way to customize the interface? We do have um, customization docs in the uh, main documentation, which I can link into uh, this after the meeting. Um, that has some basic guides for doing things like header, footer, uh, customizing the um, logo, the uh, the color scheme. Um, so that's the best place to get started. Um, if you have questions on things that are not listed there, you can ask them on the list or look on the mailing list as well, because I know there's been questions there that get posted and others have been chipping in on that. But basically, this is an area that we're still working to document how to customize every single aspect of the user interface. There's a lot to document there. Um, so the more people collaborate with this and help out with the docs there, the better they will get more quickly. The basics are already in the documentation, but we would welcome others who want to help enhance that documentation. If you're interested in doing that, uh, please get in touch with me if you'd like to contribute in that way. Um, how can we customize RDF OAI to get BibFrame? I don't know the answer to this, to be quite honest. Um, I'll have to look back at this. I'm not sure if we have anything that supports BibFrame or not from o from uh, the OAI PMH interface. I don't recall offhand, um, but I'll look back at that after the meeting. How can I limit the length and choice of special characters of the title of the PDF files in the upload section? Um, there is most fields, I, Almost all the metadata fields in the um, submission form, I think you're talking about the submission form, um, most of the fields in the submission form you can actually add a regular expression to that allow you to um, limit what values can be put in those fields. I suspect you might be able to do that here with the title of files, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think that's probably the best approach is looking at the configuration options for the submission forms and looking specifically at the reg regular expression configuration that should allow you to limit length and what characters are allowed. Uh, how do I make upload optional for some entities but mandatory for publications? Um, every entity has its own submission form uh, configuration. That's something you have to set up for entities. Um, and the upload section has a configuration itself to allow it to be optional. So I think you just need to update the submission form for those entities to make the upload section be optional for those particular entities and then leave it as required uh, for publications. I believe that's all you'd have to do. 
um, but I can uh, put some links in there after the meeting here as well. Is there documentation for redeploying updates to the DSpace 7 backend? Uh, I would look at the upgrade documentation for DSpace 7 because that has some doc basic docs on how to upgrade the DSpace backend. Um, redeploying is basically kind of like an upgrade. You rebuild the backend um, using Maven and redeploy it. So if you look at the backend up upgrade process, it would be very similar to that. Um, we don't have separate docs on just doing redeployment, but that's a good suggestion. We could possibly pull those out of that upgrade script or upgrade docs, uh, but I'd look at the upgrade docs first. Uh, customizing the theme I mentioned already, um, but the homepage is still the same. It's possible you did not, um, either you didn't rebuild the user interface after you customize it, um, or you um, have something cached. Uh, if, you, if you're running it in PM2, sometimes that PM2 uh, node app thing caches things, you might need to do a restart there. Um, so it's probably you either need to rebuild or restart if something is caching and not updating in the theme. Um, but in the, if you look at the theme customization docs, we recommend they're running the user interface in development mode while you're customizing the theme just temporarily because that will automatically update anytime you make a change. The development mode does an automatic rebuild. And within a few seconds, it's right there to look at. Um, and that just makes it easier to do the customizations in development mode. And once everything's ready to go, then you can push it out to your production. Um, but trying to customize in production mode does mean you have to manually rebuild sometimes and manually restart things sometimes. Uh, adding more metadata fields to the metadata form. We have docs on that in the submission configuration docs. Um, all the submission uh, forms are completely configurable. Right now, you still have to configure them in a way that's similar to DSpace 6, where there's an XML configuration file that describes the entire structure of the submission form. But you can add metadata fields there, change them, um, all sorts of uh, capabilities there within the, the metadata forms. Uh, so I would look at the submission documentation and I'll add a link in there after the meeting here. Has there been any movement on a particular ticket? I'll jump over to this just to note ticket statuses here. So this status is it has a help wanted label, which means that we're waiting on a volunteer to take a look at this, but I have flagged it as high priority. Um, and it's on our 7.6 maintenance board, which means we're working on it um, in a maintenance release. Um, so currently, since it's help wanted, that means there's not anybody that I'm aware of actively working on it until someone volunteers. Once they volunteer, they'll show up in this assignees area. Um, so no one's assigned to it yet, but I have flagged it as high priority, which tells the developers out there that I really wanna see this fixed quickly. Um, so the basic message here is no, I don't know, I'm not aware of any um, activity on this yet, uh, but um, I know this has been impacting a couple uh, sites in terms of theming um, when you're trying to extend themes. Uh, so I'll bring it to the developers meeting and see if we can get some movement, but I, I have not heard of anybody working on this right now. I will also warn though, <laughs> because it's July, um, and because um, a lot of people take vacation over July and August, uh, some of these tickets are going to be slow moving a little bit over the, the summer months here, at least summer in, in North America. Um, so my apologies for that, but that's just kind of the nature of vacations and holidays, obviously. Uh, but that is a high priority issue for fixing, um, hopefully in 7.6.1. And if anybody wants to work on that, it's a good opportunity to take a look at it or, or um, volunteer for it. It's possible there's a very small bug that we just have not figured out where it sits. Um, let's see, we're almost at the top of the hour. Just to verify, Natalie, do we have an hour and a half set aside here? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I will keep moving here then. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't shutting off shortly. Uh, if folks need to drop off, again, I will make sure everything gets answered in this document. We'll also copy over uh, questions that were asked in the Q&A area of Zoom and make sure they get answered in this document. So you can always reference back if you need to drop off. But I am gonna keep moving here since we do have some more time 
uh, in this Zoom room. Um, so I'm going to continue here. I see there's other Q&A questions in the Q&A chat as well, but I'm going to continue through these ones here real quick. Uh, I think it would be helpful to have a system diagram for the new Angular front end. I have a number of heavily customized instances that are due to be updated. It is not clear how the, all the commu components communicate. Um, yes, we. This is something we could we could look at uh, doing. I know that there were some old high level system diagrams when we were doing early development of DSpace Seven that were in slides. Um, I could probably pull one of those old slide decks out. I don't have it in this current slide deck of just a high level how things work together. Um, that's definitely possible to do at a high level. I'm not sure if I'd answer all your questions, but I think that's possible to do. Um, if anybody out here has something they've built already, please pass it my way or link to it in this document. Otherwise, I'll see if I can get some time either myself or from another developer to kind of um, add a high level system diagram to our main documentation. I agree it would be useful for those getting uh, used to this new setup with DSpace 7. Uh, 17 here, let's see. Trying to change default sorting, but the details have been seem do not seem to be correct. I may need more information about what you've tried. Um, I do also recall that there was some weird sorting issues uh, with the browse by sorting that I think they popped up in 7.5 and were fixed in 7.6. Um, that's based off the top of my head, but I do remember there being some bugs around this that I believe were fixed recently. So you might wanna look at what was fixed in 7.6 and the release notes to see if uh, this impacts you. All right, or fixes the problem you're encountering. Um, if you're already on 7.6, um, I might need more information here, but I can, I'll look back at this after the meeting and, and link in um, the tickets that I'm thinking about that I believe were solved in 7.6 to see if those help out. Uh, but if there is a bug there, we'd obviously want to get it fixed. So if, if there's a bug, we can get it fixed either in the documentation or if there's a bug in the code, uh, making sure it gets in a bug fix release. Um, but I do believe there were some recent bugs fixed um, in that as well. Uh, 18, is the issue in the submission form when displayed entities taken solved in 7.6? We search for an, a project and select one and we don't see, yes, yeah, there was an issue with this in 7.5 where um, when you select a entity relationship in the submission form, when you select it, it was not appearing properly on the form. There were bug fixes to that applied in 7.6. Um, and yeah, you're right that in 7.5, uh, even though it didn't appear in the form, it would be in the record afterwards. So it was really there, but it just was, the bug was that it wasn't appearing properly. Uh, in 7.6, there were bug fixes to that applied. So I think this is fixed in 7.6. I can um, link in the ticket after this meeting, but I believe that's solved now. Uh, are there plans to fix CC license integration? We have a lot of on, on we had we rely a lot on the display of our CC license on item pages. Uh, I believe CC license also already works in the submission form, uh, but you're right. I don't think it's being displayed properly on the item page. I don't recall if there's a ticket for that. Uh, if there is, um, I'll go, I'll go look after this meeting, but if there is, then I can make sure that uh, that's on our priority list as a bug fix, because that would be a bug fix that we could apply for a later DSpace 7 release. I don't think it was fixed in 7.6 though, uh, in terms of the item page, but I, I know there's been some improvements to the integration on the, on the submission form, so it should work well there. Um, if there are any issues that you're encountering though, please make sure they get in, um, bug tickets. That's the only way for us to get things fixed. It has to get into a bug ticket and we need to be able to reproduce it. So we need to have details on what the problem is, even a screenshot if you have one, things like that. Um, if we can reproduce it, then I can make sure that I can assign it to someone or find a volunteer to work on it. Um, but on the item page one, I don't I don't recall if there's a ticket for that. If there is, then I'll I'll double check that we have it on the right board so we can get that fixed 
hopefully soon. If there's anybody out there who's interested in this, this might be something that is relatively easy to fix on item pages in terms of uh, uh, pulling the, the data. The data should already be there uh, from the backend REST API. It's just a matter of making sure it gets displayed properly on the item page. So if anybody's interested in helping us out with this, get in touch. Um, definitely always take volunteer work as well. Let's see, is bulk access management automatically enabled? Yes, that's a feature in 7.6. Um, and so it's already there out of the box. As soon as you upgrade to 7.6, that feature works. And I gave a quick demo of it uh, in the slides today. Uh, we would need to set up the files, rights unrestricted on specific. We need to set up the file rights on restriction on, for a specific group of users. Is that something that's part of 7.6? If I understand correctly, I think this is related to the bulk access management tool. You, you can uh, restrict files to a group of users. So you could create a group that involves all your library employees um, and you can restrict files or entire items to that group so that it is possible to do. Uh, you can do it in bulk much easier using that bulk access management tool um, if you need to do it in a bulk feature. Um, so the feature itself has existed in DSpace 7 since I think the beginning of DSpace 7, but that bulk tool is brand new in 7.6. Uh, what's the easiest way to migrate information from DSpace 6 to 7? We have a migration guide in the documentation um, that talks about how to migrate your data. Um, and it's basically a matter of kind of dumping things out of the database and moving that over and then copying over the files. Um, as well. Uh, but I would look in the documentation. There's a migration guide that is linked um, uh, from the upgrade guide. Uh, so if you look at that, it's it's linked there. It was also in my slides earlier, um, but I'll add the link in here after the meeting. Uh, we keep seeing a white label error when we try and export from DSpace. Is this a bug? How can we fix this? Um, I'm not sure if it's a bug. I actually, I doubt it's a bug, I'll say, uh, but it may be dependent on the batch export you're doing. Maybe there is something in there that is buggy. I know batch export um, works by default, but when exporting anything, sometimes the data you are exporting, uh, if there's an issue in the data you're exporting, that can cause errors. Um, whenever you see a white level error page or whenever you see any sort of odd behavior, whether it's an error that's unexpected, or a blank page, any of those things. If you see that in DSpace 7, the place to start is that troubleshooting guide. Um, I'll link that in here after the meeting. It's again in my slides. That troubleshooting guide will let will walk you through how to look for underlying error messages. So those are the really detailed error messages that could appear on either the user interface side or on the back end in the logs or both sometimes. Um, that Finding that underlying error is what you need to figure out how to fix it. Um, so the white label error page just says something happened. That's all we know. We don't know what happened. To find out what happened, we need to find that underlying error from the troubleshooting guide. And that underlying error can let us give us hints as to whether there's a bug there, whether there's a data problem uh, with one of the files you're exporting, or whether there's maybe a configuration or setup problem um, along the way. Um, but it's important that we have to find that underlying error to be able to diagnose the problem. Um, so that's where to start. Um, if you once you find that underlying error, um, it's if you want to share it in the mailing list, um, that can uh, we can help you out there as well as needed. Uh, last one here on this page, and then there's a couple others over in the chat. Is there a way to create a set for OEI PMH that isn't based on a collection? Um, to so I believe. That's a good question. I, there probably is, but it might require code. I don't recall how that set for collections is is created. I think it's in it might be in Java code. Um, I'll have to look into this. If anybody else out there knows the answer to this, you're welcome to add it in or add links into this. But um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, to be quite honest. Um, I don't remember if there's a way to configure how a set is created or if you'd have to code it. Uh, with Java code. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, but you're right that uh, in OAI PMH sets by default are 
created by all for all collections and I believe all communities, um, but they don't necessarily represent other types of groups of items necessarily. Um, so I'll look look into this a little bit more afterwards and see if I can find a better answer um, as to how that would be done. Uh, and that's it on this page. I'm going to jump over to the Q&A area of Zoom. Oh, those, let's see, the CC license one was answered already. Um, just to verify in 7.6, you will be shown the DOI when you start the deposit so that users can know the DOI before the deposit completes. Uh, yeah, um, Jose, uh, yes, that is possible to do in 7.6. It is not enabled by default, but there is an, uh, a new uh, step, uh, submission form step in 7.6. If you look in the release notes for 7.6, it's documented there and linked to there. But there's a new submission step that you can enable within 7.6 that will pre-assign uh, DOIs and or handles, depending on how you configure that step. When you configure that step and put it in your submission form, then yes, exactly what you said will, will occur. As soon as the submission starts, you get pre-assigned either a handle or a DOI, and that submitter can see that handle or DOI. So they could copy it off if they wanted to before they even complete the submission. But it is an optional feature. Not everybody may want it, um, but it is there available if you want to use it um, in 7.6. Um, Let's see, I'm looking around for other questions. I see in the regular chat, there was another. Oh, that, that's related to that other DOI question related to what metadata field it's in. Um, yeah, I believe that that behaves the same as in DSpace 6 in terms of the DC identifier URI and DC identifier DOI. Um, versus which field it, it uses, but I'll have to double check on that. Um, uh, and we'll we'll see uh, what the answer is on that. Let's see, any other questions here today? Let's see, oh, another one just popped up in the Q&A area regarding file access rights. The question is, if there can be different rights for bit streams in one collection. Um, different rights for bitstreams at a collection level there's you can configure what is called the default uh, bitstream read permission so in a collection when you edit a collection uh, there's a I think it's called the roll tab or something like that uh, or I forget what the tab is called but in editing a collection there's a there's a tab there that lists things like being able to manage submitters for that collection as well as the um, item read permissions for a collection, and there's also a, a bitstream read permissions for that collection. If you change the bitstream read uh, group for that collection, then any new um, items, anytime a new item goes into that collection, it gets automatically assigned, the bitstreams will get assigned that bitstream read permission. Um, same for the item read permission. So I believe that that might be what you're asking about is that when they submit a new item into the collection, you want those bitstreams to automatically get certain access rights. Uh, you should be able to do that at the collection level. Uh, you also can, uh, there's customizations or there's configurations in the submission form uh, to allow you to, 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 to allow permission, certain permissions on um, bitstreams there, I believe as well, in terms of what, what permissions are allowed to have. Uh, you might be able to configure it within the submission form as well. Um, so I believe that might be what you're asking about there. But if I'm still getting the question wrong, um, please feel free to keep asking it um, in the document um, that I'm sharing on my screen um, or, or detail more information about what exactly you're trying to do there um, so I can make sure it gets answered. A couple more in the Q&A area. Let's see, hello, request a copy. Emails are encoded to prevent XSS attacks. Is there a way it looks like it got split across several questions. Is there a way to work around this for properly displaying the email in other languages? Um, good question. I don't know. Um, but yes, there, 
there's a lot of security um, built into DSpace 7 and also into Angular and the platform that we're using. Angular prevents um, certain security or has security um, uh, settings within it to prevent things like XSS attacks um, and avoid that sort of thing. I don't know if there's a way to work around um, email display. I'm not sure if I've seen this issue before. Um, it might be worth adding um, more details either in an email to the mailing list or create an issue ticket uh, to describe exactly what you're seeing, even possibly with like a screenshot um, as to how they're being encoded um, or what's happening there. Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, um, but I'd be interested to understand more of the problem so we can see if there's a workaround we can think of to, to avoid what you're seeing. Um, so I think that's those first two. Uh, do you think configurable entities will shift from an advanced to basic feature in DSpace 8 with attention given to bulk author entity assignment? I think that's going to happen over time, yes. I think that um, entities are going to be our, the future of DSpace. So I think that DSpace is more and more going to move towards using entities. Um, whether that all happens in DSpace 8 or whether part of it happens in DSpace 8 and part of it happens in DSpace 9, 9 I don't know the answer to that yet because uh, it really depends on um, uh, development priorities for DSpace 8 and what um, volunteers want to work on as well. Um, but I do think that um, what you are going to see over DSpace 8 and possibly DSpace 9 is that transition from an advanced feature into um, that sort of basic level feature of that DSpace is about entities. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done there. As you mentioned, that um, there's, uh, there's uh, not only um, just integrating it in with things like AIPs, but also trying to provide easier tools to allow people to migrate from old structures into those entities. Um, so a lot of that work is more complex than it may seem. So I don't know whether it will all be complete in DSpace 8, but I think you will be seeing that trajectory of making it a little bit easier to work on um, and a little bit easier to work with um, in terms of DSpace 8 and DSpace 9. So hopefully that answers the question somewhat, um, but I don't have an exact answer of when that will occur. I just know that that is a general idea of moving more and more towards entities. Uh, would you be, would you consider adding bulk access control for bundles, not just bit streams and metadata? Um, it could be under consideration, yes. Um, right now, um, we concentrate most on bit streams and metadata because that is really where most people want to make changes um, in terms of permissions. They want to either access restrict or embargo an item, or they want to access and restrict or embargo uh, bit streams within it. And so that's why that tool has been set up in that way. And I believe that's also how it worked in DSpace 6. So we were trying to align it a little bit with how things worked in DSpace 6. Um, I think there would be an option to manage things at the bundle level, but bundles are a little bit, um, they're a little bit hidden <laughs> for lack of a better word in that they're hard to work with because they're not really visible to users much and, and to administrators. Those who know that bundles exist, I know you may use them for certain things, but the things that people use, use the most are those bit streams and, and um, items. So if you have some use cases for why we might want to extend that tool to bundles, I would recommend um, adding those use cases into a ticket and documenting those reasons why you see that as being useful and how you use bundles in that, how you want to use bundles in that way. And that would allow us to analyze that and, and look at adding that as a new feature um, in the future. Um, I'm not aware of anybody who's working on that sort of thing right now, but a ticket is a good way to get started and start that discussion. Uh, the Q&A side, let's see, uh, DSpace entities versus DSpace Chris. Um, I'm assuming you're asking um, sort of whether those are a way to move more towards DSpace Chris. Um, and yes, as a general fashion, DSpace and DSpace Chris are trying to find ways to move uh, closer together um, over time here. Uh, as you may be aware, DSpace Chris is a product of For Science, um, who is one of our trusted service providers. Um, uh, they control the code base for DSpace Chris, so I don't have any involvement with DSpace Chris. But I do chat with their developers all the time, their, their tech leads and, and uh, CTO and all that sort of stuff all the time. Um, so um, 
the DSpace Chris team I know um, at For Science they they use uh, the same entities that DSpace Seven uses, um, and they're wanting to try and port features from DSpace Chris back into DSpace. That's happened a little bit in DSpace Seven. So the Orchid integration is one example, um, and um, there's others as well that are slipping my mind where we've taken features from DSpace Chris and moved them back into DSpace. And I think we're going to see that happening more and more as we go forward. Um, whether those become one product uh, at some point in time is still yet to be determined, but I know we want to move them closer together so that there's an opportunity to maybe just have a single product, which is DSpace, um, and make it a little bit easier on folks who want to use it for crisp purposes versus other use cases. Um, but right now, the, the goal is to bring DSpace Chris and DSpace closer together, and you should use which product better suits your need right now. Um, but just be aware that I only support DSpace. I can only support DSpace because I'm the tech lead of DSpace. DSpace Chris is a separate product. It is built on DSpace, but the Force Science team supports that. Um, so when you choose to use DSpace Chris, there is people using it, but it's primarily supported by Force Science and the users of DSpace Chris, um, whereas I'm supporting more the, the general DSpace product. So hopefully that answered the question there, um, but there is a trajectory to try and bring those closer together over time um, so that we can work together on a common code base as much as possible. Um, Jose asks, let's see, can users be put in an e-person group based on the user's IP address? Yes, that's a feature that was, uh, that existed in DSpace 6. It works the same in DSpace 7. There's an IP-based um, authorization plugin that allows you to, um, based on the IP that a user comes to, that can be put into a specific group, and then you can use that group to uh, manage permissions. So that you, works the same as it did in DSpace 6. Uh, is the DSpace 7 demo going to be updated to 7.6? I believe it already has. But uh, yeah, I, I'm almost positive it's been updated to 7.6, but I will note, get, use this opportunity to note that uh, we are working on a redeployment of the demo site. I alluded to this, I mentioned this briefly in the slides that we're working on deploying the demo site on our Docker scripts that are in the code base. Uh, that is coming along very well. Um, and I anticipate that redeployment will happen here over the summer months at some point in time, um, either later in July or in August. Um, at that point in time, the DSpace demo site will just auto update constantly. Right now, it's a bit of a manual process. We have to push updates out. Um, when the 7.6 release came out, though, I recall pushing updates out to the demo site. So it should be running DSpace 7.6. So I believe it's already on there. Um, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me. And we could push out updates um, again, but I think it's already running 7.6. Um, in the near future, it will auto update itself once we get it deployed on those Docker scripts. So anytime uh, code changes happen to DSpace 7, um, it will auto update that, that demo site um, so that folks uh, can see those changes um, occurring there. Uh, that's everything in the open questions. And it looks like that's everything in the Q and A document, Natalie, have I missed anything that you? No, that's it. I just put those from the for reference in the the Q and A thing, but we already answered them all. Yep. Yeah, and as I mentioned, we're we're getting near the uh, half an hour point here, anyways. As I mentioned, I will go through over the next um, some over the next few days. Uh, try and get to it this week for the most part and add in uh, quick answers to each of these in this um, document itself and provide links to resources that might be useful. I really appreciate that people are already adding some comments into here, um, providing some hints to folks, uh, uh, and, and in some cases saying that, you know, you also encountered this. Um, that's very useful to me to understand who's who's encountering things. And if folks have answers and beat me to it, I would love uh, folks to fill out your answers there and I can enhance those as needed um, as we go through here. But keep an eye on this document. Um, there will be answers listed within here and resources listed within here. Um, obviously this is not the end of all Q&A for DSpace. So if you have other questions that come up, the mailing list is really the best resource for um, 
for detailed questions. If you have a big detailed question or, a lot, or an area you want to um, get answered, that's a great place to share those detailed questions. If you have quick questions, Slack is a great resource, but obviously Slack is text chat. So detailed questions can be a little bit harder sometimes in Slack. But both of those are the two, excuse me, two main places that I would recommend going with your questions. Um, and I'd highly recommend others help out um, on both places as well. I do my best, as you may see, to about once a week go in and try and catch up with things um, and answer things there. Sometimes I get a little bit more time in a given week, um, but I'm not always able to keep up to date with every question on a day-by-day -day basis. Just depends on how busy my day is. So if others have time um, when you have time or know an answer to something, please do contribute in there, help folks along, help help uh, help people learn DSpace 7 as we go. Um, and thank you very much to all the attendees here. I see a lot of thank yous in the webinar chat, so appreciate all of that. I think it looks like we're probably about ready to wrap up here, Natalie, unless you see anything else that's come uh, in. Also say thank you to our simultaneous interpreter, Jovan yes. Smith, who yes. provided those services today. Yes, thank you very, very much. And again, the the document is this tiny URL link. Um, Natalie, if you could copy that in one last time, I think most everybody happens it, but it happens to have it. But if you can copy that tiny URL link in one last time, um, I will make sure at the top of that document as well, I'm going to add a link to these slides, uh, probably here within the next 10 to 15 minutes. So you'll have a link directly to these slides. Uh, you can go back through them as as you need to or share them with uh, others on your team. So thank you very, very much again for all your attendance today and um, look, forward to, look forward to hearing more questions and answering more questions on Slack and mailing lists and all that. So thank you all.